All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And um, today I'm going to do something which is perhaps a little bit more um, casual than the last couple of talks, something a little bit more lackadaisical. I like to compare myself to uh, Bob Ross and sort of just paint you a Haskell picture during my talk, and then uh, you can let yourself be soothed by the sultry sound of my voice. Uh, I don't really share Bob Ross's uh, talent for painting, and I'm also an amateur Haskeller, so at any point you see me doing things wrong, like uh, using lambdas instead of point three flip, uncurry, uh, feel free to scream as loud as you can uh, that I'm doing it wrong, and then we can sort of uh, work together to turn it into a more Haskell-ish function or whatever. Um, so basically I'm going to start from scratch and uh, refer back to, you know, Google, Google, whatever. Ed is in the room, uh, so we might actually have to use uh, the next best thing, which is Google to look up things like what's the type of lift state IO. Um, all right, um, so, so mostly my talk is going to be an advertisement for something somebody else did, which is SBV. Um, all right, so basically the whole content of my talk is this. Uh, Google uh, Haskell SBV and read this documentation, which is brilliant and fantastic, and use this code uh, in, in your projects or whatever. And uh, it's, it's great. It'll make you happy. It'll make him happy. It'll make me happy. It's great. Uh, I'm going to now, so this ends the content of my talk. Uh, as an appendix to my talk, I'm going to talk about what is data SBV, uh, what can it be used for, and uh, yeah, what, what kind of things might you want to do with it. Um, I actually have a little example that's actually a few pages long. Oops, probably should move the microphone. Uh, but my notes are here. Um, so I have a little example, and uh, I kind of like this little example because um, uh, not last time, but the time before that, uh, we had to talk about some Bitcoin contracts language, and um, and the speaker said, oh, you can just, you know, you can use SMT solvers to verify things, and it's super easy, and it's great. Um, and I agree. Uh, well, it's not quite as easy as one might imagine, and also it's kind of nice if I could just walk through an example of actually doing that, taking a, a little teeny tiny language uh, with no branches and no while loops, and showing you how you might use uh, an SMT solver to do things uh, that are interesting with this tiny toy language. So at this point, it might be useful to explain what an SMT solver is. So an SMT solver is a theorem group give it as input statements about mathematics, and um, it will reply to you either things like this statement is true, or this statement is false, and I found a counterexample. So SMT solvers, um, SMT stands for satisfaction modulo theories, and the theories in question I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, but the theories usually mean something like, I know about arithmetic, or I know about functional arrays, or I know about uh, equality, or I know about SAT solving. Um, anyway, the satisfiability means it's, it's very good at finding models of things. So it's also a useful tool to build models, to find examples. And, and um, this is also a brilliant application that you can see a lot of. Um, so, so these SMT solvers have, have really Hit, hit their stride in the last uh, decade, I'd say, and have become this really viable way of, of you know, doing programming and certifying things in the programming world. So that's what I do. I, um, I work at Draper Labs. My name is Cody Rue. That, pretend I said that at the beginning of the talk. Um, I do software verification, so you take in a program and you try and prove things about it. Uh, typically, this is a hard problem. Uh, for various reasons, but it turns out that we're, we're getting pretty good at it in some cases. Um, and, and I think this is a field that's A, become a little bit more um, salient because of, say, 
vulnerabilities, smart contracts. There's lots of reasons why you might want to verify your code. And B, you know, we've gotten better at it because SMT software has gotten so good. So how do you use an SMT software? Well, you just use S uh, SBB. Uh, SBB was developed by a very clever guy called Levent Urcock, whose name uh, you can see right here um, and also here. I actually don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to hope that I didn't butcher it too much. Yeah, he used to work at Galwa Inc., which is um, a place where they do hassle and is very good. Uh, now he works at uh, Intel, which is a company uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of. Uh, and apparently, uh, he can still do a little bit of hassle there. Um, all right, uh, so. I'm actually like th this is a great page, and I could just essentially read this page, and it'd be a great talk. But um, I'm actually going to try and uh, um, do my own stuff. <coughs> top line is cut off. I'm sorry. Yeah, What's that? I mean everything with the top line is fine. Just yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's it. Clear. <laughs> <laughs> Control L. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit horrible, which is my workflow. Feel free to boo at me uh, if you like. Um, so I'm going to write code here, and then uh, in the window to the right here, I'm going to open a shell and start GHCI, and then I'm going to load uh, I'm going to do this. Oh, and it compiles. Fantastic. Uh, all right. So far, so good. Uh, so this is my workflow. I'm going to write things here, and then I'm going to keep reloading this file. Um, so that's how I work sometimes. OK, so let's do the first sensible thing one might do um, in a talk about SBB, which is import data on SBB. Uh, wow, that is. Jeez, so <laughs> that is a bad start. All right. Okay. Wow. Type system works. The system works. Um, all right. It looks like I'm also going to need to do something that you should all be doing at the beginning of all your uh, files, which is this. Um, okay. So now I can work over here and say what is data.sbb, and sbb is just a type constructor that um, takes type and returns a new type. So it's something like list, all right? It's not actually list. And uh, this first star right here, uh, I'm going to move around the room. Hopefully the recording isn't going to be too screwed because of it. Um, this, this argument, this type argument, is A, very important, B does not appear in the definition of the type. It's something we call phantom type. So if you all know phantom types, um, I can stop talking about that right now. But if, uh, and if you don't know phantom types, then uh, this is a fantastic application of them. So it's, it's going to be fun. So why would one want a type argument which is not actually used in the body of the definition? Does anybody have? <coughs> Example. I, I don't actually have a good, uh, like, I, so, I haven't prepared this talk at all, so I don't uh, have a good example. The classic example is rewrite files. You have a type part of your RO, and you can, yeah. OK, this is an excellent example. Uh, this star here, uh, the, the type argument, is, uh, is a dummy type. So it's a type that contains no values. It is just used as a tag to say, oh, this file hasn't already been opened, perhaps. Um, and, and, and that way you can sort of guarantee that you don't open a file twice, or that you, or that you don't close a file twice, or that you don't read in a write-only file, read in a write-only file, etc. Um, so it's pretty much the same reason it's used here, which is SVB A is going to be the type of, um, finish my sentence, the type of symbolic things that represent 
a piece of data of type A. I'll explain this more later. Go ahead. So this might be a like misinformed question, but can you also use phantom types and uh, OLEX style find this finally tagless interpreters? Yes. Okay. Um, this is yeah. This is almost exactly the same way it's being used here. Okay. So ta tagless interpreters are sort of interpreters that never need to check whether the things they're evaluating are of the right shape. So, so that the tag is going to contain something about the shape. And actually often, uh, I mean, just Google's tagless, spineless, spineless, tagless evaluator. Finally tagless interpreters. I'm sorry. Finally tagless interpreters. Finally tagless, tagless interpreters. Like and you will find a beautiful example of this. All right, so, so SBV is that. Um, and now as Google, um, as Google, I'm going to refer to um, a lot, is, is just defined to be, um, so, so as Google is, is um, SBB Google. All right? So as Google is the type of symbolic Booleans. And it's going to be used to represent basically propositions about things. Um, and now it is symbolic. Ooh, also the same type, except symbolic is a monad. And is the monad of uh, things that are being built symbolically. Uh, Sorry, did you say what SVP stands for? Oh, um, I think it just stands for symbolic bit vectors, but it actually appears nowhere in the man page when SBB stands for, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, there is a real emphasis uh, on bit vectors in this library, but, but there's also other things, so um, I feel like you might as well treat it as just it's like, like it's a game, like it's a game, exactly. Uh, all right, so, um, so how do you build members of SVD Bool. Um, well, first of all, you can, you can just um, embed them. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry, uh, equals, um, wow, I'm choking here a little bit. Uh, um, So how do you build one of these guys? Um, you can just say true, and this will be. Oops. All right. Okay. So so the true the small letter just says anything that's of the boolean type class. Um, true is one of those guys. All right, so this is a brilliant idea that I believe should be implemented in the stat library. I'm glad, uh, <laughs> I'm glad nobody from the standards is here to yell at me. That this is a great idea. It turns out that everything that is a concrete data type should be turned into a type class, all right? Uh, you know, Java, do, Java does this. Everything is an interface. Well, in Haskell, everything should be a type class. This is sort of the throwing the bridges plus plus. Um, there are no concrete data types that wouldn't be better served as being abstract data types that are much later made concrete when necessary. Uh, so Boolean is one of those things, but sadly, for some reason, <coughs> programmers are used to working with ordinary Booleans uh, in their if statements, and so they don't use this beautiful Boolean type class that has these abstract true and false values. Um, now, sbool turns out to be one of these abstract Booleans, and so you want to do everything you do on Booleans on these abstract booleans, but because the Haskell library is terribly designed, only concrete booleans are implemented. So if you look at the type of uh, and, well, uh, sadly it uses concrete booleans, but ooh, if you look at this much sexier triple and, <laughs> it takes any abstract boolean and ands them. Now, Haskell did this right in the type of numbers, right? Because it says, oh yeah, um, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, if you want to add two things, they just need to be nums, all right? Some abstract number type 
that, that, that we're allowed to, to add together. Oh, but if you want to add them, they better be concrete Booleans, which is kind of sad. Um, so, so in this MDB library, he said, oh, well, that was a mistake, so let me re-implement everything and give it different names. And uh, the different names is, you know, adding a third and. Um, question again. So uh, the triple and, does that work on any Boolean algebra? Like, for instance, would it work on a bit vector? Um, that is a good question. Um, can we test this? You can call it I Boolean. I'm sorry. Call it I Boolean. Great idea. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> um, you, you can, of course, call it on Booleans, right? You can say true and and, and false. And that is false, as expected. But you can also say true. <coughs> I'm sorry. No, you can't. Um, you can say true and 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 as bool foo. And OK, uh, it doesn't know how to print this, but it does know how to type it. Uh, can I say uh, colon t and then an expression? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Okay, so uh, I parens around the expression. <laughs> that makes sense. Apparently not. Uh, well, you have a small decimal in there. Oh. Oh yes, of course. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, this is my bad. Um, yes. Okay, so. All right. Um, I'm sorry. I don't have a better example. Um, so, so, I, so I need to be a little more clever here, which is um, you do true triple and foo. Like, uh, no, you cannot. Um, so, you, so you can only and 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 things that are as booleans. Now, I I I wanted to be clever and I wrote as bool foo, thinking that was an as boolean, but it is not. Um, if I do this. Uh, This will fail with the same error message. Um, all right, great. This is a very didactic, didactic uh, talk. Um, because, because, because this is actually its type. Okay, so this works. And now, if I do bar, I say do. Uh, B foo, you know, foo, and then return true and an and uh, B foo. This is going to work, all right? Okay, so, so you can and an and. Um, this as bool, and this brings me to my next uh, <laughs> my next uh, subject, which is what is this guy? All right, this guy. Uh, I mean, it's just a macro for uh, I think symbolic. Yes, it's it's just it's just a macro for symbolic foo. All right, uh, it's just called as bool because you want to make this type a little bit more precise. Um, but um, basically, symbolic just takes any string and turns it into a into an SVD. I can't I can't point that far. Uh, it turns it into an SVD value, all right? But wrapped with this monad symbolic. So what does the monad symbolic do? Well, it bookkeeps symbolic values. Um, in particular, it, it generates fresh names and it keeps track of which symbolic names correspond to which symbolic expressions, but the real takeaway here is that I, I just give a name and it returns a symbolic representation of my concrete type. So if A is bool, then foo over here is just a symbolic boolean, which can be seen as a propositional variable. All right, Something that might be true, might be false, and that 
SAT solvers and SMT solvers just love this kind of thing, all right? They, this is, this is their bread and butter. Okay, so what can I do with an S bowl? Well, that is a good question. Um, one thing I can do is just pass it to the, to the SMT solver. So what's the type of proof? Well, it takes a provable, surprise, surprise, and it returns something in I.O. called theorem result. Okay? You do not need to understand what theorem result is, but basically you just want to take anything that's provable and um, just ask the SMT solver to prove it. And what are the provable things? Um, well, okay, tons of things. Um, but in particular, There we go. In particular, S rule is a provable thing, okay? And, and I don't see it. But symbolic S rule is also provable. I can find this. Oh, I can't. Oh, I'm embarrassed. Um, so presumably you could give foo a value true and say prove it, you would just say true. Yes, but you don't want to give a value to foo. You want to say prove, and then something that contains still these symbolic variables. That's the whole point. You want the SAT solver to find, to try all possible values. All right, that's, that's the point of having these symbolic variables, is that they can take many values. And you want the SAT solver to explore all these values. So you can just say prove foo, and it says, no, I can't prove it. It is falsifiable. Here's a counterexample. What if foo takes the value of false? Then it's not true. QD. Can you give prove $B not foo triple bar foo? OK. Um, That's fine. I'm going to interpret that as a logician and ask, uh, can you prove the excluded middle? Is that what you're asking? Yes, that's what I'm asking. Fantastic. Excellent question. <laughs> All right. Let's turn bar into something called excluded middle. Because I like long names. I program in Java. <laughs> All right. So do the foo gets foo. And then return foo or um, e not. I think that's what it was when, I, when we typed i forward. Uh, <laughs> for, okay. That's nice. OK. Um, is, it, is, is it not? No. no. I thought it was e not, but that might be like the elliptic version of it. Yeah, yeah. that was great. Um, well, this is really unfortunate. I'm just going <laughs> to type very delicately. OK. OK, so we get a. I use that to instead of B. Yes. This is why I do these things live, so that we get to collaboratively figure out what I forgot to type. All right, so this is a little ugly. Um, it would be much nicer if. All right, did you have just tape lying around? That yeah, was cool. tape. Everything's done with that. Wow, jeez. I feel, I feel very unmuggedly. Um, all right, uh, so there's a nicer way to write this, I'm sure, and uh, let's come up with it in a second because it's the kind of thing I like. All right, but um, so this worked, so let's see what the type is. Excluded middle. Okay, it's symbolic. I guess Google, now approve. Excluded middle. QED, fantastic. So, positive answer to your question. Now, let's see if I can satisfy it. 
I can also satisfy it. If you replace foo by false, then the result is true. All right, this is what SMT solvers do, right? They try to satisfy it, and if, um, if they can't satisfy it, then they say unsat. And so how prove works is actually um, sat uh, um, fmap not excluded at all. Okay, this, this is literally what prove is doing. It's trying to satisfy the negation of what I asked it to prove. Okay, it, it can't, it says unsat, and that's exactly what it means to prove something. All right, this is the kind of mental gymnastics you have to do when you're trying to do automatic improving, which is uh, essentially try and look for counterexamples. And when you're tired, you say, ah, oh, it's probably true. <laughs> which is what we do with testing, right? Um, why does prove return an IO return result rather than just a PO result? I'll let you take a guess at the answer and then I'll tell you if you're right. So that it can so that you can work with it nicely at the um, the uh, console? That, that is a pretty good guess. Um, though nicely and IO rarely belong in the same sentence. <laughs> um, it's Z3. Yes, so that, that is the correct answer. So, so actually SBV isn't doing anything very powerful. It turns out that approving uh, you know, BFU or not BFU is pretty easy, but, but sometimes you want to prove things that are slightly more complicated than that. And for that, there are tools that have been developed over decades, and those tools are very sophisticated, very powerful, and there are several tools available. So there's a unified format called SMTLib, which asks questions that look sure a lot like this. And I'm actually going to show you a little bit later what is actually sent to this external tool. And this is a completely external tool to SBV and to Haskell. And in fact, there are no Haskell bindings, which is kind of sad. Um, but there's a unified format to query these things. And so then it just prints it out to a file, calls this external tool, and then it parses the, the output and it returns it to you. And that has to be an I.O. if you want to be type safe. Question? So uh, if I recall correctly, uh, the AE fragment of first order of logic is decidable, so it might if so but can we try and prove the drinkers theorem? The I'm sorry, the, the oh, drinkers. Oh, um, yeah, that would be a little tedious, and okay, I actually, I, 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 you can do quantifiers, but I, I don't know SBV well enough to be able to naturally okay. do that. Sure. So, if you don't mind, okay, uh, sure let's take a rate check on that. So, it's theoretically possible. A. B, I, I'm pretty sure that SAT solvers do not implement this decision procedure for, um, for, for this fragment you're talking about. And, and C, this fragment you're talking about is really fragile. This is really the limits of decidability. In particular, you add equality, and that statement is not true anymore. Okay. And usually, people like talking about equality for some reason. And so, <laughs> that solvers have equality baked in. It turns out the quantifier free fragment, which means for all in front of a bunch of things, with just yeah, just one qualifier, one quantifier, and equality. That's decidable. And that turns out to be a much more interesting theory. So SAT solvers absolutely implement that decision procedure. Oh, man. Do they do I don't know what it did. Do they do Pressburger arithmetic too? Yes, but uh, it depends what you mean by Pressburger arithmetic. Again, quantifier-free linear arithmetic, um, SAT solver, SMT solvers are really good at. Uh, if you start adding quantifiers, then a, the decision procedure becomes triply exponential, which is the only example of a triply exponential algorithm I've ever heard of being implemented. And B, um, yeah, it's just gnarly. Tarski arithmetic then, isn't that one triple exponential? Tarski yeah, arithmetic is double exponential. Oh, so, what's so what's usually when you move to um, linear arithmetic to nonlinear real arithmetic, you drop down a tower, all right? So in particular, like, um, Linear real arithmetic is polynomial by some miracle. Uh, linear 
integer arithmetic is NP complete, which you know, it, it's this bizarre fact that when you work in reals, which is this huge crazy thing, things become much easier than when you work with arithmetic. And that the reason for that is kind of subtle. It's because, all right, um, I'm not gonna <laughs> this. Uh, it, it's because essentially uh, it, integers, yeah, they 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 snap, right? You you can be um, if if you're if you're between zero and one, then you need to snap to zero or, or one, and and that and that means you you branch, right? You you have this this branching that happens. But in the reals, if you're between zero and one, then that's all you you can say. You can have this continuum of values, and so you can't build this snapping, this branching that that brings NP completeness with it. This was an incredibly vague statement. Um, just, just, it's an interesting factoid that usually working with integers is much harder than working with real numbers. Sadly, computers tend to work with uh, integers for some reason uh, instead of real numbers. That's, that's too bad for program verification. It really is. Our floating points is even way, way worse. Um, all right. So I'm still on page one in the middle of the page of my elaborate talk, and the screen is switching in and out, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, hmm, I'm not sure what to do about this. Maybe just stand here holding the thing down, I'm not sure. All right. Um, OK, so one thing that we can do is uh, find something called uh, my config, which is of type SMT config, and SMT config is just going to be Z3. So Z, so so actually, SBV isn't tied to Z3. Z3 is a powerful SMT solver developed by a really brilliant guy um, somewhere around Seattle. Um, that's not true several really brilliant guys um, and girls uh, somewhere around Seattle, mostly two guys. Um, so, so Z3 is sort of the go-to for this. Um, so I'm going to use Z3 and I'm going to set the verbose option to true. Now I'm going to say, uh, let's load this file again and let's um, Yeah, let's prove with my config and then exclude in the middle and see what happens there. All right, so it still says QED, but now there's all this junk. Um, all this junk is basically uh, exactly what is being sent to Z3. So it's calling Z3 with these options. This is fantastic. Like, everybody should write libraries like SVV. <laughs> It's telling exactly how exactly how it called Z3. It's telling you exactly what it sent to Z3. So there's an open parentheses up there because the guys that designed this language really really like Lisp, as you can see pretty clearly. Uh, this is easy to parse because the point is no one should ever have to write things like this. And um, it does exactly what you might have guessed that it does, which is define S1 to be not S0, define S2 to be or S0, S1, and then say not S2, and then call sat. All right? I said earlier that um, to prove something, you, you try and satisfy the negation, and if it's unsat, then it's good. Um, and somewhere, uh, somewhere in here, there's, there's, a, there's an option that says print QED instead of print unsatisfiable, which is. <laughs> It's just cosmetic, but it's kind of nice to see QED instead of unsat. It's, it's much more sympathetic. All right, but but uh, it's it's clear exactly what's happening here, right? It's it's just a very straightforward translation of of what this guy was. Okay. Can we do first law then? Because it might be more interesting to see with the uh, degree of this. First law is it P and Q and P and P? Um. Yeah. It, I mean, it's. Not going to be more interesting, but we can do it if you want. It's it's also it's also true in class one. Uh, so uh, I I also have to say uh, implication is 
wise. Yeah, okay, it's got a nice little location. Um, so I'm sorry. So now, uh, as pool bar equals as bar and bar. Um, Let's see if I can get this from memory. Who implies bar implies who? Is it? Yeah, you know where one. Yeah, it's double. Um, yeah. Implies. Probably one could be who would be the. Yes. What's, what's nice about Z3 is that now you can actually see if I made a mistake. Uh, okay, well, maybe I made a mistake, but certainly what I wrote is also true. Okay, great. Uh, what if I make a mistake? That's true too. That's true too. Nope, it is not. Oh. If you take foo equals true and bar equals false, that's that's, that's what's great about SAT solvers, right? Is that it, it shows you all your stupid mistakes, uh, which I do plenty of. Um, all right, I have a teeny tiny additional example before we move to the serious stuff. Um, let's see. We might take a break after my teeny tiny example before the serious stuff, and, and then we'll go with the serious stuff until you guys uh, go tired and or bored both, and uh, then we'll call it a day and just sort of uh, just promise me that you'll look at this library. <laughs> uh, all right, so, hmm. all right, so something, all right, let's, let's do both. Um, so something we'll be working with a lot and that, um, SBB kind of likes is uh, is integers of fixed width. All right, let's take three. And let's return a symbolic and oops. Normally I should be able to tab and I'll just add. Oh, and this is actually going to show off another feature, which I adore. All right, so the dot equals equals is this. Um, again, because the Haskell standard library uh, made the wrong decision and uh, didn't use S rules and didn't use equal symbolic. So, so actually, I'm, I'm actually a little disappointed because you you want a double constraint here, equal symbolic A and uh, Boolean B, and then A or A arrow B. That that'd be nice. Um, maybe that's too tall an order, and you never actually find instances of this. But all right, uh, all right. So of course here I'm going to write A plus B plus C, and this is false for floats. I want you to remember this forever. This is not true for floating point numbers. All right, this is the the worst mistake you can make, assuming this is true for floating point numbers. Um, all right, we'll go on all this, but uh, it is true for ints, even if there's wrap around. So, um, yeah, let's try and prove it. And is this is it? Uh, is this going to work or not? Votes? Well, it might work. Vote, it's vote that it's not going to work. Uh, I'm sorry. Vote that it's going to type check. All right. On the fence. Vote that it's not going to type check. OK, so I'm, I'm going to count that. Yes, type check. Yes, it is going to type check. Why? That's not at all obvious, because this is a function. Like, how many times? 
proof is essentially, you know, do something like printing, right? It certainly it has to print it somehow because it's going to send it to a SAT solver. So certainly you can't print functions, right? So how could you possibly prove functions? I'm sorry. Full coverage and input, like it'll just generate all of the eight, like all the numbers between zero bits and eight bits. Okay. Do you, do you have any idea how many there are these of these three guys? Uh, uh, so and eight. To the eight times like Q. Q. All right. So uh, really, I don't have it. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first one to ask this question. You can just do Python. Python. Yeah. <laughs> That it's that it's enumerating this many things. No, no, no. Find one bad one. Uh, maybe. Bad one. I mean, maybe for us at eight, but yeah, you're right. I think it's up to like sixty-four, which I saw on the Yeah. So, so this number is huge. It is not. Okay. So, what is it doing? How is it taking a function and magically creating something that C three can understand? You were with us at lunch, so you probably know, but. Uh, Maybe you want to don't want to spoil the surprise. <laughs> Go. Constructing some symbolic objects. Exactly. So these S and eights are great candidates for building a symbolic instead of S bool. It's going to be S and eight, and you construct as many as you need to just plug into these inputs. And so it's actually just passing inputs to my expression. So normally, when, when, you, when you try and test a function, you pass concrete inputs, and then you just tested it on one possibility. Here there's, you know, uh, what is it, 16, 16 million, 17 million? So you, we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to create symbolic inputs for A, B, and C, and just pass one triple of inputs to this guy. And you're going to end up with an S bool with symbolic inputs. And then you're going to send that to Z3. So what we're really going to do is my provable expression. And I'm not going to spoil what type this is, but it's lif m3. Is that a thing? Yeah. I think so. Uh, let's see if I have it. Yeah, great. So lift M3 and then S int H A S int H B S int H C So this prove my expression does exactly what I wrote here. It says lift m however many arguments there are and apply them. All right. So um, more formally, hmm, I wonder if I can find it here. Uh, That's provable. Let's see where the instances are. Yes, this is the magic instance. Let's not highlight this. Let's highlight this. All right. The magical instance says if p is provable, then arrows from SVD A to p are provable. Okay? 
And of course, how do you implement that instance? Ooh, I love this. You don't get this in OCaml or even, even Java. Like finding the sources of things is a nightmare. Um, all right, well, this is a little uglier than I'd hoped for, but essentially, um, essentially it's exactly what we said, which is use for all, which is a way of creating a symbolic variable that's going to be universally quantified. Um, create a symbolic variable, and then pass it in to this function as argument. And then you end up with something with one fewer arguments, and then you can just pass that to Z3. All right. Okay. Now let's build a better. You're not going to show us the types of that. Uh, out of curiosity, do you have a show mm -hmm. instance for whatever that is? I'm sorry. Um, so these two questions use the word that, and um, <laughs> I don't know what that refers to. Your provable expression. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Shouldn't come as a complete surprise. But can you show the value itself, or do you just not have a show for it? Oh, I, anything inside the monad, unfortunately, okay. uh, I, I can't show. What I can do is prove it verbosely, uh, verbosely yeah, which is um, prove with my config and my provable expression, or do you want the my expression? My expression. My expression. All right. Um, yeah, this is not super illuminating, uh, except, except, yeah. Uh, okay, let, let's do both actually. So, okay, so no, no big surprise here. Let's do BB add, BB add, BB add, BB add. Um, yes. Is this actually feels like one two few? No, that um, seems right. Four. You have one, two, four three, ads four, in one, one two, three, expression. Three, four. Okay. <laughs> and then make it then equals. Check. Yeah. Then S seven. Then not S seven. Ask if that's satisfiable. It's not. It's, it's not satisfiable. <coughs> oh, and actually, we can see the unsat here. Which is kind of cute. Okay. Uh, same thing, <coughs> except with my provable expression. Aha, okay, and now you see that the only difference here is now it knows what these variables are called. And so if it was unsat, it could give me, oh yes, I know it's unsat, and uh, here are the counterexamples. In fact, uh, let me change this a little bit um, to just A plus B, I don't know, uh, something stupid, so that we can see that, um, So that we can see that, oh yeah, um, it doesn't really know what names to generate here, so it just says as the OS minus two. I don't know. Um, whereas if I ask prove my provable ex expression, oops, It, it, it remembers that A, B, and C were the names of the things I gave it, which is, which is kind of nice. But it's, but it's so nice to just be able to pass it a function, because these guys can be instantiated by concrete values. And so you could just test this expression using just normal testing, right? So, so this function is kind of nicer to have than this stupid provable expression where I have to create these S8s and I have to do the lift at 3, and that's just exhausting. Um, all right, let's change this back. Um, my other expression. Let's. Um, all right, let's do something that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's not so interesting, except it's going to show off a little bit. Um, 
some of the other things you can do. So if A and B are greater than zero, then certainly A plus B should be greater than zero. So here I'm sort of showing off the non instance, right? Because zero, yeah, this is the genius of Haskell is that I can type zero here, all right? If, if for nothing else, Haskell is a great language because I can type zero here. Um, all right, so let's see if this is enough. I actually think it might not be. Oh, huh. It is? I'm surprised. All right, so, wow, okay. So, can I, can I prove this? Okay, I can't prove it. Okay, so I actually have to give a type here. So SBD is smart, but it's um, it's not that smart. Again, 
um, Haskell did, did the wrong thing and made things too specific. Uh, everybody complained that Haskell's types are much too specific. Uh, and they are, they are in this case at least. Um, so you have all these dotted operators, these dotted equals. Uh, apparently this implies symbol wasn't taken, so they can use that, which is great. And, uh, and there, you, yeah, you just build expressions that express the intuitive thing you'd expect. And then you ask through them, it finds you these crazy counterexamples that you never think of when you, you know, forget about overflow or things like that. All right, uh, you can take a break, pick it up. Um, for sure now, I'm not gonna have time to go that much into depth into what I was gonna talk about next, but I don't know, maybe we'll have time to find the types, have, to have a little conversation before, before we call it. All right. Okay. Fresh, fresh start. Blank slate. Um, all right. Uh, so now, what should we do? Um, my idea, and I'm not going to be able to carry this out entirely. Um, my idea was to take a tiny, tiny subfragment of uh, what's called LVM IR, which is the intermediate representation of the claim compiler. Uh, LVM stands for Low Level virtual machine. Um, of course, as with all good things, uh, its name is completely unrepresentative of what it is. Basically, LVM is what you want the target of your compiler to be, because it's low level, and then there's this great sort of back end that's taken years and years and that targets many architectures. So actually, Haskell has an LVM back end, as some of you I'm sure know. And, um, so, so it's a useful language, it's a low-level language, and it sure is something you might want to want to prove things about. And in fact, I saw a beautiful talk by a person whose name escapes me right now, and I kind of hate myself, and he kind of hates me too, because he wants me to advertise, um, who does exactly what I'm about to do, or something a little bit more sophisticated, which is take fragments of LVM without branches, without loops, and build SMT formulas with them, and then compare them to, say, other fragments, and then maybe prove that these two fragments are equivalent somehow, or prove that they don't violate certain assertions. So what this person did, and again, I wish I remember their name, but it's this a Yes. Oh, um, well, <laughs> all right, so <laughs> maybe, maybe you can give more information, and somebody else will remember some more things until we come up with his name. Um, anyway, this guy verified LVM, uh, what they call people optimizations, which is just, you know, essentially pattern match on a, a few LVM instructions and, and, and then change them. Uh, typically, I don't know, if you shift right and then shift left uh, by the same amount, that's a bad example, but all right, if you shift left and shift right, uh, under certain conditions, that's just not right. So you want to optimize those into not, or if you add and subtract uh, again under certain conditions, that's not. So LVM has a billion of those that it applies ad nauseum, uh, literally. Well, not literally, but uh, as much as possible until a fixed point is reached, and um, it needs to pass these guards, which are really important. Otherwise, they're unsound. So you might want to verify these. So this person implemented a language that does exactly this, verifies that the preconditions, if the preconditions are satisfied, then this code transformation is valid. And it also verifies that, yeah, if the precondition is valid LVM code, so it doesn't have undefined behavior, uh, like I can see there are many undefined behaviors in LVM, then the transform code also does, doesn't have undefined behavior which is extremely important. You don't want to transform into code that has undefined behavior. You had a question? With Santosh Nagarakate. Um, Santosh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have you repeat his Nagarakate. last name. Nagarakate. Nagarakate? Nagarakate. Nagarakate. Okay. Brilliant guy, beautiful tool. Uh, he found dozens of bugs in LLVM by applying this tool. And he had a great success story, which was someone submitted an optimization that was like 9% performance improvement across the board, which is great if you have a compiler like LVM. Usually improvements are very 
you know, 1% improvement is already pretty good. So this guy had a cable optimization, 9% improvement. All right, he submitted it, and they were like, oh, we have got this great tool that you can use to verify your optimization, make sure it's bug free. He's like, come on, guys, who, who do you think I am? My, my optimization is great. Um, and they said, oh, well, that's funny you'd say that, because we found this counterexample, and um, you, you might want to check into that. And he's like, okay, okay, just give me a couple weeks. Uh, okay, and here's the real optimization. And they were like, oh, we found a counterexample. He's like, what was that tool again? Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, it turns out that getting these things right is quite hard. And so using things like SMT solvers that are designed to, to mechanically find counterexamples to the most plausible looking conjectures um, is a really useful thing in compiler design. Um, and um, so, yeah, so, so the question is how we can do this, and um, I'm going to sort of start writing code that, that might do this kind of thing. Um, so uh, I'm going to do the imports first. Um, yeah. I told you you should write this at the beginning of your file. Um, I'm surprised it's not done by default. Uh, import. Uh, ooh, you're going to like this one. So, I assume you're all familiar with monad transformers. All right, I, I said saying that as a joke. Monad transformers are a nightmare to me. I have to relearn them every time. Uh, this is actually a familiar nightmare. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. It's a familiar nightmare. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so people that use Haskell a lot eventually have to pass this hump. I find monad transformers were something that I had to learn. It was as hard to learn monad transformers as it was to learn monads. Like, learning monads is a little hump when you're learning Haskell, and then there's another hump down the road when you learn monad transformers. And so, um, strict, I'm glad Ed isn't here to see this, uh, <laughs> but you want strict, of course you want strict. Why is Haskell lazy? I don't know. Uh, okay, so um, let's do find a tiny subset of the LLVM language. So it's just going to be basic blocks. So no jumps, no ifs, no loops, um, and essentially nothing interesting. <laughs> but um, still it's going to be useful to sort of test out our intuition. So let's build a type of identifiers. I, you know what, I, I'm just going to say um, so I don't think new type is gonna is gonna work here. You're gonna need a rather like constructor. All right. Is this gonna work? That, that's yeah. Okay. So so I had new types and constructors everywhere. So now I'm gonna make mistakes because so I'm I'm gonna depart from my note. I I can assure you, you if you're actually writing code that's going to run anywhere. Uh, you want new type, but if you're just talking to an audience, then having constructors everywhere is a nightmare. Uh, however, um, do I even need labels? Nah, I don't need labels. Uh, I'm not going to get to the part where labels are useful. I actually had two parts to this talk where I had just basic blocks without jumps, and then I started having jumps where you needed labels to know where to jump, and uh, how to encode that into an SMT formula is actually an interesting problem. And uh, I suggest you think about this problem, but uh, for now, we're just going to sidestep it. But now you have labels that are strings, and identifiers that are strings, and you start getting the mix up, and it's horrible. Um, so the cost to pay for that is somehow having to add this constructor around everything. Sometimes you use single letter constructors, which are an abomination, but you don't want to type it out each time. Anyway. Uh, so, I'm going to use a record here, this block, and uh, originally I had a label, but let's forget about the label for now. And let's just say a basic block is a list of statements, okay? 
Uh, okay, but what's the statement? Okay, so I'm going to just say, all right, let's have just two kinds of statements. Assignment, um, so assign, um,
So the context here that we're going to evaluate in is a symbolic context. And so for that, we want all our variables to be represented by symbolic ints. <coughs> right? and, and so this map is going to be in identifier to symbolic ints. So we need data.map. Alright. Well, you have uh, a comparison, but you need symbolic booleans too. If I have comparisons, do I need some? Oh, no, because, because, why not? Is the argument to the comparison are integers? Yes. But you can store the output of the comparison. You, and can you? Because, yeah, if you have a lec and then you assign it, then, yeah, surely. And you could upcast them to 8 bits wide. For yes, you could, for no reason at all, upcast them. Except, well, one reason might be that, oh, yeah, actually, that's how LVM works. When you do a comparison, what you get at the end is not a pure Boolean. You actually get a word in memory. That word in memory. It has bits, right? And then maybe you want to shift shift that to the left. Why would you ever do that? I have no idea. But it turns out compilers do this all the time. They take booleans and they do things that they're clearly not designed for, like treat them as ints. Okay, so good question. And my answer is we are going to pretend that all these booleans are int eights. And um, that's that. Yeah, that's kind of messy in the code, but we'll make it work. Uh, <laughs> it's not that messy. All right, so we have the context. Now we have our state. All right, and this, I don't know. I Go ahead and guess what this is going to be. <laughs> I, this is a long shot. Um, so var state is going to be the, the sort of the result of our symbolic evaluator here. I'm sorry, what did I say? A is going to be the type of the result of our evaluation. So it's usually going to be S and H. Um, what would you be tempted to put here? Any suggestions? State T symbolic State T, and then what? Uh, the state comes first, doesn't it? The, the bar part comes. Fantastic. That's exactly what I had written down. And then symbolic. Very good. That means you were either already knew this or were listening at the first part of the talk. And either way, I congratulate you. Um, okay. So one thing that I so I started writing this talk. And I did not have state t here. Does anybody want to guess what was instead of state t? A regular? Close. <laughs> the other one. A reader. So it was a reader. And the reason for that is when you're evaluating a language that does not have side effects, and despite appearances, this language does not have side effects. You never need state. You only need a reader. And you only need to read the state. Okay? This is counterintuitive because sometimes you want to add things to the state, right? Every time you declare a new variable, you need to add it to the state. But you can do that in a reader. And a really nice mantra is that evaluating a pure functional language is, happens in a reader monad. This is a pretty good mantra. Now, sadly, reader t bar context symbolic 8 is a nightmare. I could not get it to work. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're feeling brave, uh, you know, do this 
symbolic evaluation at home and replace this state T with a reader T. And uh, if you can get it to work, uh, great. Uh, I, I don't feel too guilty though because um, I, I do know the state T starts becoming important if you have jumps. And in my talk, eventually I had jumps. So I thought I was going to be super clever and start with a reader and then change it to a state when I needed, which was already a stupid idea to start with. But, but even with the pure sort of uh, block, uh, basic block evaluation, I, I couldn't get reader T to work. And it's really the T that screws with you. Um, okay, so uh, for the people that don't know this off the top of their head, which I can easily forget, forgive, um, state T um, SMA is actually sort of S arrow M A S. All right. So you know the state T SMA. You want to produce an A, but to do that, you're allowed to have a state, you return the updated state, and all that is wrapped in a monad that allows you to do this magical action uh, outside. All right. OK, now we just write function signatures, and then, I don't know, use autocomplete. Uh, because everything just falls from the types. Okay, so this is the type of what we want to build. Okay. So, so this formula is going to represent essentially the, the state of things once we've evaluated a basic block in LVM. All right. So the state isn't necessarily uniquely defined. And so in particular, my formula might might be a little bit fuzzy around the edges. And in particular, it might be both satisfiable and not provable, or something like that. I'll explain this a little bit later. Um, so base plot B equals, and then I'll do something that we all do in Haskell, which is actually kind of ugly, is unbox, and then just define a formula that's, I'm sorry, just define a function that has exactly the same name, and that's just all on the unboxed guy. And then sometimes I'll forget the prime, and then I'm going to get weird type errors that I don't understand. It's going to be very fun. So here, it's not exactly clear what I should do in an empty block. So when in doubt, um, I can just return the real true. And yeah, all right, that works. Uh, but it turns out the literal true is just true. This guy. All right. Okay. Now the good stuff. Okay. So originally, I had to un sort of unpack this and have a uh, pattern match on S inside here, but uh, it turns out you don't actually need to do that. However, I didn't figure out how to um, yeah, how to avoid a do block here. Uh, now the point three aficionados are gonna grow here. You feel free to grow. Throw me empty plastic uh, bottles. Um, Alright, so we're just gonna take the formula that comes from S. So in particular, you know, a block is just a list of statements. So we're going to just get create a formula for each statement, and then just somehow append that to the rest of the formula. So we update this statement formula, and then we get the formula for the rest of the block. Alright? And 
when I wrote this a long time ago, I had something more clever here. I had a precondition, all right? So, so the block formula associated with the basic block, it took as input another formula, which was the precondition. And then essentially, what this formula returned was precondition implies postcondition, all right? So it was the weakest, uh, the strongest postcondition. Uh, you might have heard weakest precondition somewhere in your life, and um, it's definitely something you should look into. But basically, uh, it, it's a very natural thing to sort of take a, take a formula and a block of code and figure out what the strongest formula that is true after you execute that block of code, assuming the precondition is, all right? Or vice versa, you take a, a block of code and a formula that is supposed to hold afterwards, and you figure out what the weakest precondition it has to hold before for the formula to hold afterwards is, right? We're not going to do this. We're going to do something much simpler. Just take the formula associated statement here, take the formula associated to the rest of the statements here, and are just going to and them. Uh, so here, um, yeah, just this form. questions at this point? So I've, so I've done something not too crazy, which is a list of statements, I take a formula for each statement, and then I hand them. All right? So for sure there's a nice way to write this point free. Um, in fact, I did this in the comments here. I use something called fold m, which is kind of horrible. Which is like, all right, how do you, you know, yeah, mod at M foldable T, all right, forget about <laughs> it. Don't worry about that some other day. Anyway, with with full M, you, you, you can do the, the thing you'd expect, right? Because we're just, you know, taking the formula here and taking the formula here and adding them, yeah, this sure looks like a fold, but it's got all these monadic actions interleave and see so you need to be a little bit clever but but it's not that hard. Um, also what I wrote is still like, there's a lambda and what I wrote which is stuff. You don't want lambdas. Alright. Okay, so here is the good stuff. Alright. Yeah, all right. All right, so, so what did I do here? So, so kind of what formula does this correspond to? It's an assignment. And, you know, assignments use a certain kind of connective, which, you know, sure looks like kind of formula. Now, all right. So the formula I want here is I equals e. Alright, so this is not very hard, except, except. Well, um, so I'm going to turn e into a value, which is going to be a symbolic word h. All right, because that's what happens when you symbolically evaluate an expression, you get a symbolic memory word, all right? If, if I was doing something more realistic and I had memory, then D 
things would be a little bit more complicated, but um, ultimately, yeah, this, this is actually a pretty nice representation. It's just a symbolic set of bits. All right, this is kind of what happens in compilers when you evaluate expressions. Um, okay, so you get E, and then you want to return somehow I val equals E val. So now you have to kind of say, well, I val gets something. Um, and, you know, I might just define it to be S um, ident i. Alright, and then S ident i would be a type identifier to our state. And then S ident Okay? Okay. Okay, so the first question is what goes here? Um, it might not be immediately obvious. So intuitively, what do we want to return here? We have an identifier and we want an int h, right? Something just a memory word. But because it's because it's an identifier, really what we want here is yeah, is, is, is what? That's hard when we don't have the SVB documentation in front of us, but there's a, like, a way that you can construct the, okay, that's good. So, what's the, what's the, like, the constructor that you're using for S int 8 that like took a string as an input? Mm -hmm. Do you have one of those? Let's see. What? I'm guessing this is it? That's unfortunate. You can also do cold there, I, I, S and oh, there you go. Alright. Okay. So S and H. Alright, so you think S and H here? No. Because we're in a you're you're in bar in bar state, which is a monad. So you need to look for Okay, but S and H is also in a monad. Are you gonna look it up? Are we just gonna look it up in the in the map in the state? Or context. That's a good question. Are we going to look it up in the map in the state? No, because it's a new assignment. It's a new method. So oh, this is, oh, this is the sign, not for the right? Yes. So, yeah, this, so that's, that's going to be for us. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so, so these are the two remarks I've opened here. Okay, so first of all, we're in the wrong one at here. So, so what's the solution for that? Does anybody know off the top of their head? I did not, by the way, of course. Just lift. Yes. It's lift. Now, what's the type of lift? Let's go. Alright. No. But then what's the function? So so lift is this is this kind of naughty thing that uh, that that puts you into monad transformer territory. So what is lift m? Lift uh, yeah, okay, so, so lift m has a different type, and it's the wrong type. Uh, so you really want lift here. And, uh, and this works, great. Okay, so we've done the right thing. Uh, you said, okay, oh, but maybe we just want to read it from the environment, because that's, yeah, that's what you want to do with variables, right? Um, but, 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 we're in SSA, so any variable that appears on the left of an equality in an assignment it's going to be fresh. It's going to be new. Yeah. No one's ever seen it over. So, so it's so it's completely new. All right. So, am I done here? Is the real question. I'm sorry. Ah, yes. So, something's happened, right? I have a new variable on the left hand side of equality. Um, so you're going to dot a dot equal equal operator. Is that what you meant, or was it, is there a dot equal? Operator? Sorry. I mean, we're, we're trying to we're trying to encode it. Oh, yeah. Is that what you meant? You had originally written i equals e. Yeah. So e equals in the mathematical sense, but of course, programmers 
yeah, don't like equals in a mathematical sense. So, so they, they're reassured by this equals equals, but yeah, equals equals in Haskell is something operational. So yeah, so it's dot equals equals. But it's morally, what I want to say is I is equal to E mathematically. That's what I want to express. Um, mathematicians just write equal. Programmers know better. Um, okay, so now I need to insert it and uh, hmm. I am all right. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm not going to have to guess here. Uh, so modify just takes just takes the transformation on the state and it applies it in the state monad. All right, so now we want to modify the state um, just by applying something. I'm just going to call that something insert, and it's going to be i, and then what's the value I want to insert? What's i val? I just defined it up there. Um, so now I just need to write the insert function. For some reason, I don't see it in my notes. But uh, I'm sure we can figure this out together. It's you get it from data. Yeah, yeah, it's just the map of insert. Oh, yeah, OK. I, I, for some reason, I thought I'd wrap that. OK, so insert already does exist. OK, fantastic. Except, oh, wow, this is, um, is this going to work? Yes, it is going to work. Um, it's going to work because I don't have a wrapper on string, though I guess there's a nifty new future or if you have wrappers around types using new type, you can inherit all their type class instances. How do you do that? Generalize new type deriving. Okay, just um, generalize new type deriving. Uh, it's it just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, all right. So, so okay. So I've inserted i, and I've returned equals equals. Okay. So now all that's left is to write this, and we will. Not really have time to do this, will we? That is a little sad. I was really looking forward to doing this. So I can do it. It's actually pretty straightforward. It is just, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Why don't you go and then just discuss it like after it's like all there? Just like put it out there and then we yeah. Talk about it. All right, that's reasonable. I've sort of departed from my um, sort of. Departed. I made some changes already, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, so it might not work out of the box. Yeah, no, it's going to look so bad. All right, um, all right. Of course. Oh, of course, yeah, as well. Oh, let's just copy paste it too. Yep. Okay, so I, I do need to change this one a little bit. Um, so ID now is directly a string. Oh, wait. No, this is good. This looks good. Good, good, good. Good, great. So this show is superfluous. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, no, I don't want to say that. Um, all right. So uh, the only thing I kind of wanted to mention here. Okay. So here's where you look up in the state, and and yeah, you just look things up. It, a reader is sufficient here. Here I do an insert, but um, but that's okay because you're allowed to you're you're allowed to do inserts on reader monads. You just you just need to say with reader compute this other value, and there you modify your your context and, and you call monadic action with that. So so this is possible. Now, if it's reader transformer, things become more complicated, and, and I didn't have the energy or the time to work it out. 
but but definitely a reader might actually work here. Um, okay, so here is the lookups happen. I just fail on, on nothings because, at least in theory, um, I should never hit a variable that that um, I haven't inserted in my environment. That's sort of been very observed. Now, it's true that a basic block can refer to variables that aren't defined anywhere, right? Um, this this is allowed. And, and, and you can just insert them beforehand just, just by convenience into your context. Um, okay, so what else? Uh, yeah, so these are just the lifted operations, right? This is just plus lifted to a bar state, right? This is the applicative syntax. Now, I'm a little unhappy about this because plus is infix, and I'm forced to write it in the prefix notation if I'm going to use these nice little applicative decorators. So. Dan, do you know a way to write this in fix fleet? All right, there's yeah, no... People have invented syntax, but I don't think it's in the Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know what the syntax would be. It'd probably be kind of ugly. Anyway, uh, so, so it's plus, but we write a prefix, and we just write this dollar sign and this plus sign, and if I had three arguments, then I just write another one of these, bracket times, you know, as val, when you're and when you're writing evaluators, you're gonna you're gonna see this kind of code a lot. So you see, I use it on this line, and I use it on this line, and I use it on this line, and all these lines look a lot alike. And um, yeah, this from enum is is where I turn an int. Uh, sorry, what? Uh, from enum. Oh yes, Sh shift l. Okay, shift L is defined in SPV, uh, but it takes an int. So somehow I need to turn an int, an int A into an int, and of course there's a cast, so it's from enum. And uh, in shift L, yeah, it's defined in SPV, and it's defined in SPV to be exactly the thing that's defined in C3, because C3 has all the normal things you'd want to do on bit vectors, because C3 is designed for exactly this kind of work, exactly type checking uh, you know, C value code. So shift L, shift R are, are really straightforward, right? And then this LEQ that came up earlier, we said, oh yeah, it's a Boolean, but actually we sort of want it to be an int 8 because, you know, in a real programming language, that's sort of what it would be. And so um, it turns out that there's a function called one if, which is one if and only if uh, a certain S bool is true. And great, that's exactly what we want. Um, And uh, so there we go. Um, so I, I just you know lift this compares and just call this one function. So you, uh, same for negation. I mean the same, but a little bit different for negation. Um, essentially, I just say it, if it's zero because you know v is a value. And what does it mean for a value to be true? Well, if, if it's not zero, right? Okay. So I say, uh, so so I say if it is zero, then return one, and otherwise it returns zero. So one of zero returns zero. Basically. Okay. Um, so where's a search? Okay. So I forgot a case here, which is formula. All right, so there's something funky that's going to happen here, which I did want to talk about. Uh, I left myself a helpful little comment here. So you just take the E value, and you say, oh, is it equal to zero? But that's the opposite of what the assert says, right? It's, it's an assertion is saying it's, it's true, right? Tell me that it's true, please. I beg you. So it's so it's not um, so it's not zero. Uh, all right, I think the two down here is superfluous. Let's see if this works. Yes. Okay. So so why do I put equal equal zero here? Does anybody have an idea? Does that have to do with like the unset actually being the correct? Yes, it does. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the formula generated by this. Um, 
by the, all these functions. And then we ask, is it satisfiable? So is there a way to find values for all these variables such that all these things are true? And in particular, the opposite of the assertions are going to be satisfied. And so what I'm going to be looking for is counterexamples to my assertions. And I, and I have to do this because otherwise, if I just ask for proof, then, then it would be pretty easy to, to refute these equalities. Just take i to be something that's not e which is kind of the opposite of what we want. So if we say set, it's going to try very, well, it's going to make these equal, and then it's going to try and make these equal, and then find values of all my free variables that make these assertions false. And then if it can make them false, it's going to say, oh, I found a model. And this model is, is going to be refuting my assertions. So that's great. Um, all right. So, so that's sort of all I have to say. I do have some examples which I can copy and paste if you want. Maybe you'll be interested, maybe you won't. Uh, what does this do? Uh, it shifts left, and it shifts right, and it asserts that um, that's just the identity, right? It shifts left by three, shifts right by three, and then it asserts that, um, yeah, it just asserts that the, the, the result you get is the original result, or less than or equal than the original result, actually. So it's something we heard. Um, does anybody have an, an intuition about whether or not this is going to be true or not? Yes? No? All right. So I can read all these. So add state just just um, just creates fresh variables, right? If my block refers to the variables that we find outside, we want to add those to the context. Come on, really? Too often that it does happen, 
And man, if you change the order of anything, anywhere in your code, including the names of variables, these, these magic constants like minus 64 can change. So, all right. But at least it gives you counterexamples. All right, that's all I have to say. Sorry I ran a little bit over. And uh, thank you so much for listening and engaging. Questions? So in order to change whatever thing you are using, there's just some you know function you apply to there and that has different config values you can set and stuff. Yeah, so set with and I'm assuming the default is Z3? Yeah. The default is Z3. Z3 has a really good um, so SMD config is which SAS software am I using? Which, you know, verbosity options, which, you know, what are my defaults for yeah. very minor, so the universal, yeah. But Z3 has a really good rep. It's fast, it's well maintained, it's used by a lot of people, it's, 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 a, good, it's a good default. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. So you went through this effort to remember which variables you made up for which names. Yeah. And I was wondering if the SPV uh, or the symbolic monad already did that. That's like, a good does question. It remember, like if you use the same name twice, does that mean the same variable or does it make up two variables? It, it makes up two variables. Okay. Um, yeah, it's very common to reuse the same string when you're calling this create me a variable. And in that case, the semantics you sort of want is give me two different guys. Okay. Um, now, somewhere in the hidden depths of the state monad that is the symbolic, um, probably you could you could dig, dig that variable up if you really tried. Um, I looked for a minute, I couldn't find it. So I, I actually think this is the more reasonable approach yeah. to, to treat symbolic as this black box that you don't ever want to open. Good question. All right. Any, any other questions? You can come talk to me. I mean, I'll be here for, for a little bit. Thank you again.